In this example, we'll be looking at a cantilever beam with a point load at the end. We're interested in finding the deflection of the tip. This cantilever beam is a total length L, the magnitude of the load is P. The strange part about this problem is that the cross section changes. Over this first region on the left hand side, we have a flexural stiffness EI sub 1. Over this other portion, we have a flexural stiffness EI sub 2. We'll see how that comes into play. Let's start by orienting ourselves and sketch up the deflected shape here. Here's the fixed end. Here's the undeformed shape of the beam. I know that at the fixed end, that point doesn't move vertically, nor does it rotate. I know that the point under the load must move downward. And if I connect these pieces of information, I'm left with that deformed shape right there. The deflection of interest is right here, deflection at the tip. Now we can start our four step process. Step one, real moments. This should be very quick. We've memorized the moment diagram for a cantilever beam. We know that it's triangular, concave down, magnitude PL. Now wait, you say, what about that change in cross section? Well, this is a statically determinate problem. And what statically determinate means is that all of the forces can be determined from statics alone. That change in cross section does not affect the equilibrium considerations. Step two. In step two, we apply the virtual load. So I'll sketch my beam in here. And recall that we apply the virtual load, the unit load, at the location of and in the direction of desired displacement. So I want the displacement at the tip. I want the displacement downward. So I'll apply at the tip a downward force. In the virtual load method or the unit load method, this takes a magnitude of 1. Step 3 is to draw our virtual moment diagram. Once again, this should be simple. You should have this moment diagram memorized for a cantilever with a point load at the end. Magnitude is the force times the length, or 1 times L, or just L, and the curvature here is downward. So, so far, everything has been quite normal. We haven't had any problem. We haven't even accounted for that change in cross-section. When we move now to step 4 is where this gets complicated. In step 4, we calculate the deflection. We're interested in the deflection at the tip and this is 1 over EI times, oh wait, but EI changes. I need to account for the EI or the flexural stiffness in each region of the beam. So I'll sneak a little sub 1 here and I'll only integrate over the left portion of the beam. So we'll integrate from 0 to L over 2. So now we need to go back to our diagrams and we need to think, well, we need to split these up at L over 2. So let's split them up. Pen not working. OK. So let's split these up. Now we need the values here. By similar triangles, the value here is PL over 2 and the value here is L over 2. And so we need to account for the shapes over that region of beam that we're integrating. So let's draw our integral in picture form. So over this region, we have the following two shapes. We'll account for the magnitude
and that's our integral over this region of beam, the left hand side. Now we need to add in the integral over the right region. So we'll multiply by 1 over ei2, integrate from l over 2 to l, and now we'll look at these shapes here. These are just triangles. The magnitude of this peak is PL over 2 and L over 2. So let's review this. This top term is the integral over the left side of the beam. And we need to split up the integral because the flexural stiffness changes. This second integral is the integral over the right side of the beam. When we split up the integral, we need to split up our moment diagrams. So the left side of the beam has a trapezoidal moment diagram. In both cases, this is a trapezoid here too. The right side of the beam has a triangular portion of the moment diagram for both the real and the virtual load. Now it's a matter of doing the integral. There's an easy one and a hard one. The easy one is the bottom one. Triangles, one third height, height, base. That one we'll leave to the end. Let's try to figure out the other one. Thankfully, I have a table entry for a trapezoid times a trapezoid. So if I look in the third row and the third column, I have that pretty uh, difficult looking expression right there. I'll notice that it refers to quantities called m1 and m2 and m1 prime and m2 prime. Those are just values uh, on the moment diagram. I'm going to return to my moment diagram and I'm going to very carefully label my points m1, m2 and m1 and m2 prime. So here we can see one of the shapes, not both of them. It doesn't matter what you label as m1 or m2 as long as you're consistent and you keep them on the same side of the shape. I'm just going to go from left to right calling this m1, m2, m1 prime, m2 prime. Now that I've labeled the points, it's a matter of plugging and chugging. 1 over ei1 times, here's where we look at the formula above, 1 sixth is the factor. m1 prime is L, 2 times m1, m1 is PL plus m2, PL over 2 plus m2 prime, L over 2, times m1, m1 is PL, plus 2m2. So 2 times m2 is PL over 2. Close this bracket, and we have the L at the end. Now here we need to be really, 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 really careful. This happens any time that we have a tabular solution. We need to make sure that we're translating correctly. L is the length of the base of the trapezoid. And so if we look at the length of the base of the trapezoid, that is L over 2. A little bit unfortunate that we have this ambiguity notation but that's always going to crop up when we use tabular solutions. Let's look through this again. 1 sixth is right here. M1 prime is right here, it's L. M1 right here, it's PL. M2, it's right here, it's PL over 2. M2, M2 prime, M2 prime, L over 2. M1, PL m2, pl over 2, length of the base of the shape, l over 2. That's the first term. Now we can put away our integration table and complete the problem. I'm going to add in 1 over ei2. 1 third is the integration factor for a triangle times a triangle. Height of one of the triangles 
height of the other triangle, the base common to both triangles, and now we have a good amount of arithmetic to do. It's not difficult conceptually, but it is a pain in the butt, and we do need to be careful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out. We have an L times an L, and, and you'll notice that there's an L in each term in the parentheses, and an L over here. That's an L cubed. We can also factor out a P from here, and we have the 6 and the 12. So that's a P L cubed over 12 and the EI1 from here. Now I'm left with simply evaluating the fractions inside of the bracket. First term has a 2. Second term has a 1 half. Third term has a 1 half. And the other term has a 1 here and a 1 half, which is a 1 half. Add in the second term, 1 over EI2. PL cubed from the top. 3 times 2 is 6, times 2 is 12, times 2 is 24. This is 3 and a half, or 7 halves. The 2 in the denominator multiplies to give us 24 there. So this is equal to 7 PL cubed over 24 EI. 1 plus PL cubed over 24 EI2. This actually is our answer. Now this answer is just a jumble of variables and numbers. It's really hard to know if this is correct or not. So let's look at two ways of checking our work, or at least seeking consistency in our work. Way number one is to think, what if EI1 is equal to EI2, is just equal to a constant EI? So this would just be a, a cantilever with a fixed cross-section. In that case, we have 7 plus 1 on the top, or 8 twenty fourths. 8 24ths is 1 third. Delta at the tip would be equal to PL cubed over 3 EI, which we'll recognize as the correct answer for the deflection at the tip of a cantilever with a constant section throughout. So we're happy. Next is going to be units. The deflection should be in length. Let's see if the term on the right hand side evaluates the length. P is in units of force. L cubed is in units of length cubed. EI, we've discussed previously, is force length squared. And so this is indeed in units of length. So now we're a little bit more confident. We found both that the units are of length and we found as well that in the special case that this is a constant cross-section, this does evaluate out to a previously known expression. This finishes our example. The difficulty that we've dealt with here is how to break up the integral any time that there's a discontinuity, and how then we have to break up the moment diagrams and account for them in the integration tables.